Hey guys, I'm Siobhan, an internal medicine and rheumatology specialist. Tonight, I'm doing a nocturnist shift, where I spend the night in the hospital looking after inpatients. On the way to the hospital, I pick up some treats for the medical students and residents who are also on call tonight. Now it's time for handover, where I get a list of patients that I'm looking after tonight, and a heads up about the sicker patients that I need to check in on. Yeah. Okay. okay, I just got handover on over 100 patients. I've got uh, four pages to look out for. Got it. Attention, please. Cold blue. Oh, shoot. Dial. As I rush into the room, I see a nurse doing chest compressions. I learn the patient was recovering from pneumonia, and just a few minutes ago, he was found unresponsive and without a pulse. We jump into action, following the ACLS protocol to resuscitate the patient. Multiple rounds of chest compressions and epinephrine injections, but despite our best efforts, we weren't able to revive him. So now I'm gonna call the family to let them know. Um, this wasn't expected, uh, so that's always a tough conversation. This part of the job is always difficult. You get better at breaking the bad news, and the words come out a bit more easily, but telling a family their loved one has passed away just weighs on you. This is Dr. Desha, we're calling from the hospital. I'm so sorry to tell you, I'm not calling with good news. We'll see you in about 20 minutes when you get here. Okay, and again, I'm so sorry. Bye. I always try to take a moment, to take a breath, to acknowledge that feeling before continuing on with my shift. Okay, so what was I saying earlier? <laughs> um, I got handover from the residents about 120 inpatients that I'm looking after if anything comes up overnight. Already, I've had five pages to see patients and there's about 12 patients I've been told that I need to follow up on particularly tonight because they're not doing so well. So let's get moving. <laughs> okay, just ordered some food before everything closes. Uh, there's definitely no time to eat right now. I'm gonna pop it in my call room and hopefully Hopefully, we can get back to eating some dinner soon. I'm getting really hungry. Okay. Goodbye, my friend. Bye for now. I got your page. Yes. So I have this patient. He's a new AML. He's day 14 of his uh, three and seven chemo regimen. Okay. Um, he's already on Tezo. Current situation is he's febrile, tachycardic, and hypotensive. Oh. His oxygen saturation is doing well on room air. My only concern is that it's a new fever and he has no neutrophil count. Okay, so it's febrile neutropenia. Yes. All right, let's go exactly. look at them together. Sounds good. Okay, let's, let's go. Do it. Okay, let's see the patient. This patient has acute myeloid leukemia, which is a type of blood cancer, and is currently receiving chemotherapy. Between the cancer itself and the chemotherapy treatment, this patient has undetectable neutrophils in their blood. And neutrophils are white blood cells that act as one of our first lines of defense against infections. And if someone like this, with very low neutrophils, gets a fever, we call it febrile neutropenia, and we take it extremely seriously. It's one of the few times that we liberally give antibiotics, even if there's no sign of infection aside from a fever, because these patients can develop severe, life-threatening infections incredibly quickly. All right, I totally agree. He's yes. looking septic. Yeah. So let's culture him, Look, make sure we're not missing any organisms. Yes. So blood cultures, chest x-ray, get a urine. Yep. Um, and then maybe broaden out. Um, he's just on Tazosin now? He's just on Tazo, yep. Okay, so add a dose of Vanco. Sure. And then we'll see what comes back in the cultures. Sounds good. So okay. cultures, urine, chest x-ray, Yep. and then broaden out to Vanco. Perfect. So I'll call pharmacy. Okay, let's do Thank it. You. While the pharmacy sends up the new antibiotic, Olivia hangs another bag of IV fluids to try to bring up his blood pressure and lower his heart rate. And I know that she'll call me if things don't improve. All right, thanks guys. Hopefully I don't see you again tonight. Okay, what's up? So Siobhan, I have a patient. He's a multiple myeloma. He's day plus four post his auto transplant. Um, he's very, he's feeling very nauseated tonight. Mm -hmm. um, he did have malfolian pre-transplant. Um, so I think it's just the chemo that's causing him to be super nauseated. I was wondering if I could get a PRN order for some Zofran. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, which room is he in? He is in room 17 bed two. Okay, I'll, you know, I'll just go take a look, but otherwise that sounds great. Wonderful. I'll put it in. Thank okay. you. Okay, okay. Thanks. thanks. Bye. First time back in the call room all night. 
Oh my gosh, I am so hungry. It has been non-stop. Oh, I can't wait to eat some food. <laughs> Okay, since the code blue, I have seen, let's see, 17 patients. And every single patient is someone that I don't know. So you have to dig into their history. You've got to meet them. You've got to examine them because you don't have a baseline and you don't know what they're normally like. So you, it's hard to tell, like, is this a big change? Is it not? How much should we investigate? Anyway, <laughs> oh, it feels good to be able to sit down for a moment and catch up on paperwork <laughs> before I get called again. Oh my gosh. And I've got to say, this reminds me so much of residency. Like, it is such a flashback. Same rooms I would have been in, walking the same hallways. And I went down into the emergency department to see one of my patients. And I was sitting there with all the residents and medical students in the same room. The junior residents were reviewing with the senior residents. I was like, oh my gosh, nothing's changed. It is the weirdest feeling. Okay, I just got paged about a patient vomiting blood. So I'm just going to go and see them now. So the patient's alert, oriented, and her vitals are good, but I'm worried because my physical exam suggests that she has really severe liver disease. So I wanna look on the computer and find out more about her. Okay, so I can see that the patient does have liver disease um, caused by fatty liver. Um, she was admitted a few days ago with hepatic encephalopathy, and that's basically confusion that's related to the liver disease. And her last scope showed esophageal varices. Now this could be the source of the bleed and that's extremely concerning. Things can get a lot worse very quickly. This actually makes me a lot more nervous. Esophageal varices are enlarged veins in the esophagus, which is caused by liver disease. The scarred, damaged liver prevents blood from flowing normally. This causes increased pressure, which leads to enlarged veins that can easily bleed. So right now we're going to assume that this is a variceal bleed until proven otherwise. So here's the plan. We're going to get a stat CBC to check the blood counts and see if this patient needs a transfusion right away. Then I'm going to give IV pentoprazole, which helps reduce the stomach acid. IV octreotide, basically it's going to reduce the amount of blood that's going to the intestines and hopefully slow down that bleed. And then ceftriaxone, which is an antibiotic because right now she's at high risk of getting an infection on top of everything else. And of course, we have to consult gastroenterology because at the end of the day, they're the ones who can actually stop a bleed because they're the only ones who put the camera down someone's throat, do the scope, and they can actually intervene right where the bleed is. Okay, first we'll just return that page. <laughs> okay, yeah, no problem. I can put in that bowel prep order. <laughs> okay, no problem. Okay, bye. Hi, can you please page uh, gastroenterology to this number? Oh, okay, perfect, thank you. I'm repeating the CBC now. Sure. That sounds reasonable, I'll let you know. All right, they're gonna wait to see what the CBC is and decide if they have to come in tonight. In the meantime, I'm just gonna go and check in on her one more time. As I walk back into the room, the patient's vomiting more blood and her blood pressure is dropping. We need more help. So I turn to the nurse and ask her to call a code blue. In the meantime, I order packed red blood cells to replace the blood that she's rapidly losing. The patient is drowsy and has already aspirated some blood. She's not protecting her airway and the chances of her aspirating more blood is extremely high. So we decide to intubate her. As soon as her blood pressure is stable, we wheel her down to the intensive care unit. And now she's in the hands of the ICU doctors. Okay, so now she is in the ICU. And at this point, the gastroenterologists are on the way from home. They're gonna scope her urgently in the ICU and try to stop the bleeding. Um, wow, that all just happened really quickly. It actually sort of gives me flashbacks to one of the scariest moments I've ever had in residency, when a patient had this massive variceal bleed and we actually had to put this balloon down into the patient's stomach, fill it up with water to try and tampon it and stop the bleeding. I'd never seen anything like that before. And I just remember how shocked I was. Anyway, I made a whole separate video going through this experience. So check it out if you want to learn about it. Okay, now I've seen 20 patients. I'm not sure how many more to go. <laughs> Good thing I didn't have to sleep because I just realized there's no pillow here even. They really don't expect you to sleep. All right, that's it. Another night for the books. <laughs> you know what? I am absolutely exhausted, but the whole night was better than I expected 
probably because I had such great residents on, which keeps me company, and the nurses were awesome, especially the ones in the heme onc area, the hematology oncology area. So much fun to hang out with. So be sure to subscribe, and that way I'll see you in the next video. So, bye for now.